Welcome into K State Online. I am Mason Voth. That is Derek Young. This is the KSO show, more specifically, our preview show as we get ready for K State KU in the Sunflower Showdown. A big weekend for the Wildcats as they try to keep their pace to make it in the Big 12 championship game, which if they went out, they can do. And also, you want to keep the streak alive and extend it to 16 games against the Jayhawks. So we'll see if K-State can do that this weekend. Before we go any further, though, a good reminder for everybody is that K-State is gearing up to go to Ireland next year. And what better way to kick off the 2025 college football season than cheering on the K-State Wildcats in the Aer Lingus College Football Classic in Dublin, Ireland. The Cats will square off with the Iowa State Cyclones on August 23rd, 2025. Whether it's a quick trip to Dublin for the game, a multi-city adventure throughout the Irish countryside, or exploring the Emerald Isle on your own, there's a package for you. Visit Cats2Ireland.com for information on official travel and hospitality packages. That's Cats, the number two, Ireland.com. All right, Sunflower Showdown Week, DY, K-State. Uh, right around a 10-point favorite in this game. Were you surprised at a at the line going into it being that big in favor of K-State, even though it is a home game? A bit, just because regardless of how Kansas has performed this year, whether it be that 1-5 and five start, obviously they're sitting at 2-5 and five now thanks to the win over Houston. Aside from a two-score loss to TCU, which – you know, we watched that, and I, I didn't really consider it a two-score game, even though that was the final result. Kansas has been in every game, and they've led in every game. There's an argument to be made that they could very easily be 5-2 and two and, instead of 2-5. and five. So a 10-point spread seems a little big, but on the flip side, I, and I put this out not too long ago, Kansas State's the only school in the Big 12 with – three 20-point wins over league foes. Now, not all of them count as conference wins, obviously, because Arizona is treated as a non-conference game, but they are the only ones that have three 20-point wins over Big 12 opponents. So, um, And they are number one in points per drive, and I believe only one of six Big 12 schools with under two points per drive allowed. So... Uh, though the Jayhawks have played in ever, in close games just about all the way through, uh, at least in their losses, Kansas State has dominant numbers and dominant wins. Yeah, K-State has, has been really good for the most part when it comes to just taking care of business against your bad opponents the last couple of years. Like, they don't play with their food that much recently, which is probably kind of interesting for people to think about because early on, like, Chris Kleiman, it seemed like every – every year would have kind of an unexplainable loss. I mean, everybody remembers West Virginia in 2019, uh, 2020 had a lot of those were, uh, those were explainable losses, but you still felt like K-State shouldn't now. have lost those games. Uh, and then 2021, uh, there were a handful in there that you just go, man, this is a, a not so good performance, but really since 2022, still, they've been pretty good at taking care of their business. And people still think that they still have those, like, you know, you know, just ridiculous losses. But then when most of those, when you go back and look in hindsight, like last year, Oklahoma State felt that way in real time. And then they end up in Arlington. BYU felt that in real time, and they, and they still haven't lost a freaking game. So yeah. Tulane you know, in 2022. I mean, they Tulane in 2022. USC in the Cotton Bowl. <laughs> I, I would say a little bit of Iowa State last year is a little bit of that, though. Just probably, yeah, you're probably right. The way that it happened, Iowa State wasn't special. Um, it took a special weather event to probably make it so, but you know, it that one still felt like one you probably shouldn't have let get away. Yeah, no, that that's definitely fair. Uh, looking at, at last year, and I, I think they would probably agree with that. And I know people are going to love that we once again are bringing that game up, uh, on a podcast to talk about. Uh, okay, uh, in this game for K State, we know that. Avery Johnson's been on a roll throwing the football. Uh, they've gotten some good performances from receivers. Tight ends have been great all season. And KU has kind of a mixed bag in their secondary. They got two corners that are well-known, but they're kind of banged up at safety. What do you expect in that matchup in this game? I expect it to maybe be a little bit volatile 
because Kansas State has found an explosiveness in their passing game recently, and that's credit to the wide receivers for taking a step forward, but also Avery Johnson for making significant strides on a week-to-week basis. Now they have some explosiveness in a passing game, and it's something that you have to respect and, and honor for the Wildcats, and that makes them even more difficult to defend. And Kansas is susceptible to the big play, but they are also susceptible for creating negative plays. They, I know they had four interceptions or four, four, four turnovers last week, and you could say, man, Houston just gave all those to them, and it sure looked like it at times. I'm not going to lie, but the results are the results, and it's not even just that game. KU has forced 11 turnovers in the last four games. So I expect maybe some volatility, right? Like, KU gives up big plays, but they create them too. Yeah, there, there's a little boom and bust nature to how they they do things, and we saw that last year yep. uh, in the game for K-State and KU, where K-State hit some big plays on them, but then also KU was able to – they had they had a takeaway. They also could have had a, a game-sealing pick six at one point uh, that they ended up dropping. So everything is on the table uh, for KU, obviously, and, and the defense can kind of hop up from there. Uh, the run game for K-State wasn't as much of a featured product against West Virginia. Where do you expect that to be in this game against KU and K-State, maybe getting back to utilizing DJ Giddens and Avery yeah. Johnson's legs? He didn't have a carry last week. Yeah, I, I uh, on that front, I think it has to be a lot better than it was last week, obviously. But if KU is going to devote and commit as many guys in the box as West Virginia did, as Colorado did late, then it is hard to block five on seven, five on eight. And then everyone's like, well, let's just get more bodies into it. Then you're talking about a quarterback run game when you get an extra blocker. But if you don't have that at your disposal, you don't have that at your disposal, you know, depending on Avery Johnson's health. So it's like, well, let's get the tight ends in the run game. That's great but everyone keeps saying they want to play Dylan Edwards more. You can't play Dylan Edwards more if you're going to play multiple tight ends on the field. And because you have to have Keegan Johnson and Jaden Jackson out there to block. Those are your best perimeter blockers in the run game. So um, it's a little bit damned if you do, damned if you don't, which is why the passing game does have to be there if Kansas decides that they want to take away the run game in the same manner that Colorado did late and West Virginia did throughout most of the ball game. or and this is what I'm hoping, is that they do have QB run game at their disposal this week. Yeah, I I think that that's uh, something that K-State would probably like to use, and you feel better about using it after Avery Johnson basically got a clean week last week against West Virginia. Thing about K-State's defense, this is kind of a a weird matchup for them because one half of the defense, I think you should probably feel really good about what's in front of them. The other half, probably decides the game on if KU's in this and can actually win it or if K-State does what the the Vegas number suggests they should do and win by double digits. K-State's defensive line and the pressure that they force, you would feel like there's an advantage there. Also being able to kind of stop or slow down Devin Neal is there. But K-State's secondary has continued to struggle, and KU has very – I mean, it's more than capable. They have just very talented and good receiver play. Um, What do you make of the KU offense versus the K-State defense in this game? It'll be interesting because I do think people are going to roll their eyes, but I think the KU offensive line is improved. That is a group that I believe is allowing the least amount of pressures in the entire Big 12. So that's no small thing. And they still have a pretty good run game with Devin Neal, Jalen Daniels, and Daniel Hyshaw. So, uh, you know, and on the flip side, Kansas State's the best rush defense in the country, one of the best in America, and they create the most pressure on quarterbacks. So it's kind of like, boom, best against best here. Um, people are going to roll their eyes. I get it. I, sometimes it doesn't appear that the KU offensive line's that good. Uh, we watched that game, I think, against West Virginia in a hotel yeah. room where it looked pretty pitiful, but the stats are the stats where they have a decent running game, and they've been protecting Jalen Daniels much better which is probably why the turnover margin has been starting to reflect that as well. So I think the KU's offensive line, maybe they weren't great early. I think they've been pretty good lately, but I also don't think that they played a defensive front as good as this one either, 
So it could be more so them feasting on defensive fronts that are inferior, uh, at least in comparison to the one that they'll see from Kansas State. Well, it's, uh, it's interesting to, to hear you say that. Where where do you think the K-State secondary matches up in this game against the receivers and the way Jalen Daniels has been throwing the ball? Because like you said, turnovers uh, have not been there recently. Like Things are looking better and cleaner for this KU offense. And I, I think that's the thing where their last two games are far different than the games that came beforehand because they struggle in those games, but they were turning the ball over. They were making critical mistakes. Against Arizona State, they just played probably a comparable team and a good team on the road. One of those – defense hurt them. Yeah. yeah, one of those later game environments. And then last week, obviously, they beat the snot out of the worst team in the Big 12, uh, which is something that not every team in this league can say. I mean, they lost to TCU, and TCU lost at home to Houston. So – Houston can give some fight occasionally, and KU took the fight from from them. So where where do you see that? I just think that's I was probably a reflection in Jalen Daniels connecting, being a little bit better in those tight window throws because he's not throwing in the same windows as he was the last couple of years with any Kodal Nicky as his offensive coordinator. Everything was schemed up a lot more. Guys were a lot more open. Now those windows are tighter. That means the throws are tougher. He's made those throws recently, and the offensive line is blocked recently. Yeah, that the offensive line thing for KU, that's probably uh, one of the more notable and underrated aspects of, of come them a long way, maybe you know, getting things the going last, the right way. The last two or three weeks, they've come a long way. Again, that could be a reflection of opponents. I don't think Arizona State or uh, Houston has the greatest defensive front. Yeah. Yeah, we'll see uh, what it looks like this weekend for K-State, KU there. Um, With K-State, I mean, this is something that I don't know that it has great value in in how the players may think about it, but this kind of streak that K-State's on winning this series, 15 straight, it's pretty unheard of for to play 15 consecutive years against somebody, win all those games. Um, How how do you treat this game? Do you view this kind of like I do where – uh, a team shouldn't win that many times consecutively. So at some point, the, you know, things are going to go bad and you may just not be able to avoid it. Or is this team kind of built to to withstand, I think, the pressure that comes with winning a 16th straight game in this series? Absolutely. Look, you know you know me, I was kind of in that Ohio State-Michigan rivalry for a while. Games, a rivalry that should be even much less one-sided than this one. And that, what was it? Ohio State went on a streak there where they went with Jim Tressel to Urban Meyer without ever once losing to Michigan. And the only time that Michigan won was, I believe, in the interim year of Luke Fickle in between those two coaches. So, you know, I forget the exact number, but I think that's like if you remove the year where Ohio State had an interim head coach, I think Ohio State like ripped off like 16 or 17 straight as well which is pretty ridiculous in a, in a rivalry between two teams that should be on more level footing, at least you would think, than Kansas State and Kansas. Ohio State and Michigan both consider blue blood programs. But to your point, what I will say is, yes, at some point that streak's going to come to an end, and it's probably going to feel brutal for Kansas State because Kansas State's not really getting any worse. So you're going to have a good Kansas State team at some point lose to KU, and that's why it's going to feel brutal. Hopefully it's not this year's team, obviously. But what I will say is, with every year that that comes, yes, I I think the players and the coaches feel it. They know it's been 15 straight. With that responsibility, unfortunately, does come a lot of pressure. And I think we saw that a little bit last year when they got behind and the pressure mounted. I was very surprised that they actually came back and won that game because I felt like they played like a team with a lot of pressure to win that game. I think there's more pressure on Kansas State to win this game than Kansas. Kansas is 2-5. and five. They have next to nothing to play for. This is their Super Bowl. If they don't lose, they won't win it, then you know what? We've already lost five other games. What the hell does it matter? For Kansas State, not only are you protecting a 15-game winning streak against your arch rival, but you're still in the thick of a Big 12 title race, and a loss is just painful at this point because Iowa State and BYU keep winning. 
So there's a lot on the line for the Wildcats. That's why one of my keys when I write it up this week, the pick and preview, is I actually think it matters that Kansas State scores first. Because if they don't and Kansas scores first, that pressure on becomes more considerable. Yeah. Uh, so I I'm glad that you bring that up talking about, you know, the stakes that are involved with this game. Because I've been thinking about that this week and and every and really going back to last week before um even the West Virginia game, thinking, you know, if Casey gets past that, whatever. Um it, I don't know how you feel about this. And, and maybe it isn't right to talk about right now because the game hasn't happened. But if K-State doesn't win on Saturday, um, is this season already a failure at that point when you think no. about it? Because what that does is you basically zap your chances of making the playoff, playing for a Big 12 title, all that. And then in addition to that, you've lost this win streak and dominance over your rival in a season where you very clearly have the better team, things are going much better for K-State than KU right now. Like uh, you said, no, I, why, why isn't it a failure of K-State? Because I think I still think there's a path to Arlington. I know that I just even mentioned that Iowa State and BYU keep winning, but BYU has got some losable games. In my opinion, they could, I think they lose at UCF this week for one, right? Do, do they lose again? I think they can lose at Utah. I really do. So that's another one. I think they could lose a home against KU. I think KU could be K-State's best friend at the end of the year because I think KU is still good enough that they can beat BYU and Iowa State. So Iowa State, Matt Campbell, and his – I always say this because he's actually from Ohio. He sucks against teams from Ohio. They typically give him a, a pain in the ass. They still play Cincinnati, and I think that game could be interesting. So that's the only reason why. Now, if you lose to Kansas and don't even go to Arlington, it's a failure. I agree. If you if both of those things – come to fruition. And I know that was probably the scenario that you were talking about, but I can still see seven and two Kansas state make it to Arlington. Okay. All right. Well, that I guess that's a little positive to, to bake in there, not just for this weekend, but uh, for any game down the street. Wouldn't stretch. you agree that those, those games that I mentioned could give Iowa state and BYU problems. I, I think they could. I, think, I just, I think, I, there, I think there are more hurdles in those two teams uh, schedules than meets the eye. And I think last week kind of opened my eye to that. I think probably so, but I think until they actually lose one, it's tough to envision that they're going to lose two. UCS uh, like that. Game. Yeah, we'll see uh, how that goes, which uh, we'll be talking about here in just a couple moments with Best Bets. So uh, we'll get ready to do that. But before we dive into Best Bets, I want to tell you about the Nickel Home. If you're looking for quality long-term care for a loved one, check out the Nickel Home. The Nickel Home is a nonprofit, community-owned, skilled nursing facility in Glasgow, Kansas, with a focus on creating the most individualized care for each of our elders, we offer many unique ways to care and entertain your loved ones and make them feel right at home in rural Kansas. Our facility features many common spaces for our 32 residents to use both inside and out. Space is enhanced through our over $750,000 in self-funded renovations over the past six years. A ratio of eight patients to one nursing aide helps us ensure your family feels just like our family and ensures we have plenty of time to provide quality individualistic care for all those in our community. If you want to see what life has to offer in the future, visit us on Facebook at The Nickel Home or check out our webpage at www.nickelhome.org. And if you go, tell them KSO sent you. There you go. There you go. All right. Best bets time. Uh, bad week last week. I went 0-3. D.Y. went 3-0. So good week for him. Uh, yeah. Uh, don't feel great about how Nebraska went out there. Uh, that, cool. that was a game where it was like... Uh, I was doubting and hating on Indiana, but I just can't deny them anymore, so I'm done with that. BYU, I guess I'll kind of start to deny and hate a little bit more because they uh, they played with their food against Oklahoma State when really nobody over the last month had done that. And then Alabama, I felt pretty good about it uh, after the first half when you know Tennessee didn't score again. Uh, and then all of Ten Alabama's problems came back in the second half that they've been having. Uh, but good week for you. Michigan, Illinois, none of those were really ever threatened. No, uh, I, I, I feel like all three easily hit. Michigan, they Illinois, did. I think it was, it got to what, 21 7, and then the brakes got put on. And yeah, it, yeah, it just <laughs> was over at that yeah. point. Georgia, I felt like, that, to be honest, it felt like they went kind of wire to wire on Texas. So I felt comfortable about that. And obviously, KU absolutely smoked Houston. 
Yeah, no worries there. All right, week nine, I'll try and get back on track. D.Y. tries to stay hot. Uh, all Big 12, this was not planned, <laughs> no. uh, so we won't even talk Big 12 scoreboard here. Uh, it'll be a pretty quick show today. Uh, Texas Tech, I'm taking the Red Raiders plus six and a half on the road at TCU. Tech got beat last week. It was not pretty, but I just don't think TCU is anything special. I think Tech, even if they lose again, I don't see them getting blown out by TCU, so I'll go with the Red Raiders. I don't. Uh, yeah, I don't mind that. The concern is if Tech gives up like sixty, which is potential. <laughs> and they, uh, TCU is the offense that could try and score sixty. I know that that's <laughs> where that's where that's what would scare me. Yep. Uh, Utah. This was this might shock some people, but Utah is only a three and a half point favorite at Houston. Look, Houston is really bad. Their issues come on the offensive side of the ball, which same for Utah. But Utah at least has a really really good defense. Still, the only thing that would get Utah in trouble here is if they just decide to quit on the season. So we might know pretty early on if Utah is going to be able to hit this number or not. Yeah, you probably just need to avoid like a defense or special team score, I would think. Uh, and then my last one, Colorado, Cincinnati. This is a Cincinnati hate uh, play. So and I like I know what it's like seeing a game in Boulder this year. The talent that Colorado possesses, I think that. At home, they should win by at least a touchdown over That's Cincinnati in that late window. Because we talked, Cincinnati had the benefit last week of getting a two-hour jump on Arizona State, who had to go out. Well, actually, I guess it was three, technically. but uh, So a noon local kick, nine back in Arizona. Arizona State had to go out there and play that. This week, Cincinnati now has to go play the, what, that's the 11 o'clock kick, essentially, for them. So it's a, it's a late one. Uh, for the, uh, it's very for the late. Guy. We're after an early one, and you tack on the cross country travel. So, don't eat that pick. Uh, I got Baylor, Oklahoma State under sixty five. Look, I, I think Oklahoma State games are going to have a hard time going over. Uh, their formula now, last week's game even like maybe more confident on this. I know Baylor tends to score a lot, and in some cases give up a lot. But Oklahoma State's like you know we're not even going to try to pass the ball anymore. So that kind of makes me think it goes under. And I think Oklahoma State could probably stop Baylor just enough. Uh, have they quit on the season? That's the problem. If they have, then uh, I could be in trouble. But I'm counting on Mike Gundy to keep them enough locked in to where that formula he used to try to upset BYU, I think it helps uh, this one go under. Uh, 65 is a lot of points for an Oklahoma State game, in my opinion. Arizona, Arizona minus three. I think this is just a spot for me. I don't really like Arizona, but West yeah, these Virginia, are two teams that are not fun to predict no, what they're going to do right now. But Arizona is the home team, and you got West Virginia probably making is this the longest trip in the conference? It's one of them. Um, right after getting smoked by Kansas State, they think their season is over. Um, it felt like the way they came out in the second half against K State that they already thought their season was over at that point. They had dudes three of their top four. Offensive players. I knew Garrett Green probably wasn't going to come back, but then you heard about Wyatt Milam, their best offensive lineman, Jaheim White, their best running back. Those all of a sudden, those guys aren't going to play in the second half. And I'm like, why? Did I miss something? It was very bizarre. So I just get bad, bad, bad vibes out of West Virginia right now to make me think that they are not covering a three point deficit on the road across the country. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point there on West Virginia with some of those. It's like yeah, the green one made sense after you saw the hit that ended the half, and then you're like, okay, so what happened to to White and Milam? Like, did Milam just go, eh, you know, I'm going to be a first-round pick. Uh, <laughs> it may not be worth uh, what's going on in this game. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get out of here. Yeah, and then they lost one of their best running backs too. UCF, I'm just – it doesn't look right, but BYU should have lost last week. They got to go across the country. Another a lot of cross country Big Twelve trips this year or this week. So I'm I'm going to ride the travel, uh, and because this game started as a BYU was a favorite by about three, I think, and that line flipped quickly to UCF, almost a two point favorite. So I'm just going to listen and follow along with everybody else there, um, and I do think at some point. I said this in the Big 12 Power Rankings and used my quote, how BYU is doing this should not be sustainable. It has been to this point, but at some point, 
you know, that, that, that slipper or, you know, the, the clock's going to strike midnight and it's not going to work. Yeah. At home, they had looked pretty invincible where the, the, the breaks that they had gotten had led to blowout wins until that Oklahoma state game. And we already saw their only other road game. They got it big on Baylor and then let Baylor get all the way back in it and have a couple chances there at the end of the game. So this, yeah, I, if I had to pick a side UCF BYU this weekend, it's one of those where it's if they're, you're telling me that UCF's the favorite, I'm buying the UCF is the favorite in this game. But we'll see if the uh, the BYU magic continues. Although, the last time where a line kind of looked weird to me with a UCF game, it was UCF minus 14 against Colorado, and then they lost by like five yeah. touchdowns. Yeah, I'd like to know what people saw on UCF at that point uh, to to go with a line that big. That was you. If you put every bet on the board on Colorado that weekend, whether it was their, their point total, the game's point total, the spread, whatever, Colorado was winning you a lot of money. Uh, Arizona State, Iowa State, only two teams in the Big 12 not playing this weekend. They get their uh, second buys early in the schedule before resuming play next week. So. That is a look at not only best bets, but also the Big 12 scoreboard this week. Uh, any other thoughts around the Big 12 going into the weekend? I was playing around with the, this uh, Big 12 like simulator to see who goes to the Big 12 title game. And an interesting thing happened, or that I discovered. I have Baylor winning three of their next four three of their next three games because they have a bye week the same week that Kansas State has a bye week I believe Arizona or Baylor Baylor host Oklahoma State this week very winnable next week they host TCU very winnable week off and then they go to West Virginia I mean <laughs> I'm not saying Dave Aranda's got it made but that is a path to maybe keeping his job in Waco. No, I talked about this with Drew on Monday. Uh, Dave Aranda and then might get Houston the job done. He might that. get to come back another year. And then the fourth one is actually at Houston. And then they host KU. Like, they could win out, technically. Yeah, the Bears The Bears are back. They're all the way back. So, uh, he, Dave Aranda's still a fraud, but he's getting a, a nice, cushy schedule this year. Um, so, we'll see how that ends up working out. But, I think this is going to be kind of a fascinating weekend in the Big 12. I None of the games are like crazy good, but there's some intrigue in a lot of them to see how some of these teams uh, end up responding. So I'll be there, fascinated to see not, how that goes. There's no, not one game like that is between like the top five or six teams in the Big 12 that you're like significant title game implications. The one that probably – comes closest to Cincinnati at Colorado. Uh, if I ask you right now, do you know which game in the Big 12 is the most expensive ticket currently? Uh, this is going off of Vivid Seats, uh, what like ESPN just has baked into their website. But uh, the, the cheapest ticket uh, on the high end for a Big 12 game right now? I would guess it's probably not Cincinnati or Colorado at, at Colorado. Since you're asking the, the, it, it's probably the sunflower showdown or tech at TCU. Cause tech TCU is kind of a rivalry. Uh, great call. You named all three of them. K state KU at 105 is the cheapest ticket. And then tech TCU at 96 and then uh, Colorado Cincinnati at 87. Uh, do you want to guess what the cheapest ticket is altogether? Uh, yeah, I'm going to guess Ooh, this one's, I'm going to guess not BYU at UCF. So my guess would be, I know Utah, Utah, because Houston doesn't go to games. I would say Utah, Houston. Correct. $2 gets you into Utah, Houston this weekend. If you really want to see it. Uh, let's go look just for a little look ahead next week. Uh, still a lot of good tickets out there. If you're a cat fan and want to go to Houston next week, tickets as low as $6 apparently. So, uh, yeah, I mean, you go see the cats on the road. I don't really like that city, but that's an easier one to make probably. Yeah. You know, go check them out one time and then you never have to worry about going there again. Uh, all right. 
Let's go back to K-State KU and refocus this thing and close it out. Talk about the Cats and the Hawks and our previews and everything else. K-State is to win this game this weekend, D.Y. Who is your MVP on defense for the Cats? Defense, I will say Damian Eli Leo, because I think if you take away the KU run game, which K-State's taken away everyone's run run game up to, to this point, besides the QB run game against West Virginia, if you take away the, the run game for KU, I think you can pin your ears back on Jalen Daniels because he is the worst quarterback in the Big 12 this year when blitzed. Okay, I like that. Uh, I am going on the defensive side of the ball with Keenan Garber. We saw last year he kind of likes to make plays against KU. Like conversion. Yep. Yeah. He, you know, there have been struggles for this group, so they're going to be very important in this game. Uh, so I think Keenan Garber steps up and probably has the best game of his season on Saturday against KU because they need it and because he'd like to uh, stick it to the to the team from Lawrence. He was pretty good against Arizona. Yep. Yeah, he had the he had the nice pick against Arizona that was at a crucial point, kind of you know yep. really fully shifted the momentum of the game. All right, same question on offense. If the Cats win, who is the offensive MVP? Not to be cliche, but I'm just going to go Avery Johnson. I don't know how many times I've gone Avery Johnson this year. I actually think this could be the QB run game. We'll see. Yeah, I'm I'm in the same boat. I mean, I I could try and do something different. But, yeah, Avery Johnson's the guy here because the passing has taken the uptick. The QB run game could come into play. Like, this could be the ultimate Avery Johnson game. And, the again, the story says that it should be. Avery Johnson is the man of the future and the man of the present for K-State. He should be able to lead them to a dominant victory over Kansas, keep the streak going, get it to 16, and keep the Cats on the track to Arlington. Uh if you had to go and give a score prediction and how you see this game playing out, number one KU hater Derek Young, where do you where do you lie? I think Kansas can score. We didn't give our Kansas State bets, but my uh, Kansas State bet would be over in this game. Uh, I think unless the totals moved, it's a fifty-five and a half. I would go over that because. I do think Kansas gets some points. I, I I don't know if Kansas will play the Ray game, but they'll play the Ray game. This is going to be excruciatingly tight, I think, in Manhattan. And and I think they are a team that's not going to blink too much by the crowd. They're pretty older, experienced. A lot of upperclassmen on the field. A lot of guys that played in Manhattan in 2022. I, I know the weather, I think, prevented that from being a great environment, but these guys have played in front of pretty good environments before, so I don't think that's going to necessarily rattle them. I think they're going to play a really, really good game. Uh, we ju I just talked about that upper class, upper the upper classmen that a lot of those seniors, whether it's Jalen Daniels, Devin Neal, Kobe Bryant, Melo Dotson, J.B. Brown, Luke Grimm, Quentin Skinner, um, Lawrence Arnold, Jared Casey. Those guys. This is this is what they have to play for. Uh, the, they are responsible for making Kansas not the laughing stock of college football anymore. So what they have accomplished is pretty solid already. But this year has not gone the way that they wanted. They're not having the special season that they wanted. So the last thing for them to prepare for and to maybe solidify that legacy is to be the class that ended the streak. That's why I think KU does compete for a while. I think I think kids they just scores too many points for them. I got it 35-27, K-State. Okay, well, you uh, snuck your K-State best bet in right there. Uh, I get to sneak mine in. And look, uh, I've explained to people that the longer this goes on, a lot of things suggest that this shouldn't happen in sports. You shouldn't be this dominant over one team like this for however long. But on the flip side, you could probably look at it and say, well, you know, uh, K-State did it to uh, K-State K in basketball for a while, so – uh, I guess, you know, it's just evening things out. Um, K-State's the better team. They're at home. They have the advantage in a lot of places. And I, I think K-State covers the 10. Uh, I think the only thing that – if this was any other team, we would be poo-pooing them and we would be saying that, now they're not very good. K-State handles this game. Uh, this would be no different than 
you know, Oklahoma State coming in and the position that they're in right now or some of these other teams. Uh, I've got K-State 38, KU 21. Uh, I think it could be somewhat similar, like you're saying, uh, probably to a similar script to the 22 game where uh, KU kind of gave some resistance early, but K-State made enough crucial and big plays to just kind of keep extending that thing. And eventually the, the game got to the point where there just wasn't going to be enough time, no matter what KU did to make up the deficit. So do I feel good about it? No, but I think I don't feel good about it just because of how much uh, stress I think comes with this game. Uh, if you're a K state fan. So uh, yeah, I think the I cats take care of business here. I get it. I, the only thing I would take issue with is I don't know if we would still see it like the Oklahoma state game. If it was any other team, just because KU is led in every game and probably should be four or five. Like Oklahoma State's getting torched every now and then. Like KU's never been torched and they've given games away where Oklahoma State has kind of earned their losses, so to speak. KU has kind of butchered their wins, so to speak. All right. Well, they're going to get torched this weekend. So book it and so. cook it on that yeah. one. Uh, all right. If you want more previewing K State, KU, Drew's got a great look at what's going on this weekend and recruiting for K-State football, head over to On3, find kstateonline.com and everything else that we have to preview the weekend uh, and the matchup for K-State. KU will have plenty of post-game coverage after the game as well, and then a normal Sunday show on Sunday. I think everybody will be back in working order there. So a lot of things to look forward to and plenty of other things to check out from the week at KSO right here on the YouTube and uh, the podcast if you haven't already. So for Derek Young, I'm Mason Voth. We will talk to you next time, and uh, the next time that is will be tomorrow night after the game, K KU from Manhattan at 7 o'clock on ESPN2. So that'll do it for today's edition of the KSO Show Preview.